buyers that have become more adaptable to the COVID environment. So we see a higher proportion of deals getting done prior to auction. Hello, everybody. Dominic Neshi here. This is another episode of the Wealthy Podcast. And today we are very lucky to have Eliza Owen from CoreLogic. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Eliza, it's good having you today. You just put out a new article and it is how the Australian property market is coping with these lockdowns. Um, what I really like about talking to you is you've got the facts, the figures and the actual raw data to tell us um, how the market is responding. Um, you just released that report. I've gone through it and there's a couple of main points that I think are especially um well, they're great highlights, really. It explains a lot for us. So, I mean, well, let's just sort of work down the line. One of the things that I found pretty interesting is paying attention to auction clearance rates. For me, it makes sense to pay attention to that data. It's a very clear, easy metric to see, do people want to buy houses and, and apartments or don't they? Um, what what have you extracted from the auction clearance rates data relating to, you know, lockdowns and stuff? Yeah, great. Thanks, Dom. And I'm really glad that it's a useful report for yourself and the industry um, in these uncertain times. The first thing that we've noticed around auctions is that the number of auctions that typically get held through lockdown periods um, kind of depends on the extent of the lockdown. So through stage two lockdowns across Sydney last year and for Sydney and Melbourne for most of 2020, the longer we were in lockdown, the more volumes tended to taper. So the number of properties getting taken to auction was smaller and smaller by the week. But the results from that smaller base tended to get better. So if we look at Sydney, the historic average clearance rate before COVID was sitting at around 62, 63%. Um, through the most recent lockdowns, um, the past uh, or the two weeks to July 4th, the results were coming out with a clearance rate of about 74% which is just amazing to think that, you know, the city's shutting down, um, some people find themselves out of work and you've still got a really high clearance rate. So when you dig into the numbers, you start to see that that's because um, A, we've in an environment with much lower interest rates than we were this time last year, um, but B, you've also got agents and I think buyers that have become more adaptable to the COVID environment. So we see a higher proportion of deals getting done prior to auction, which is still counted as a successful auction result. You've got more properties being negotiated after the auction event, and you've got the adoption of essentially online platforms. Now, I think it's hard to separate out how much people like using those online platforms to buy properties now versus just how much stronger the market is and which of those factors is really contributing to a higher clearance rate at this time. It's probably a bit of both. Um, but I think what is very clear is that the real estate segment has become very adaptable. They know which properties are going to work now in this kind of um, post stage two environment. So when it comes to circuit breaker lockdowns, they just get deals done, get it happening online um, and a, a bit more selective, I would say, about the kinds of properties that they're taking to these online auctions. It's, it's interesting because although we have been able to adapt to change and we can, we can sell property in a variety of measures, the, the interesting thing for me is that the demand is still quite strong uh, and people, it, it tells me that people are looking at this with an optimistic lens where these lockdowns, current circumstance, it's paying much, much less of a factor in people's minds and they're happy to sort of forego some of those 
those qualitative things like going out and touching and feeling and they're just saying, hey, I want the property, I believe in property and I'm going to buy the property. So <laughs> it, it's, it speaks a lot to the strength of that as an asset. Absolutely. I mean, and, and I think that's a key feature of the property market and its performance around COVID-19 is that when people have made the decision that they're going to buy property, it's such a big decision. It's such a big financial commitment. It's such a big, uh, what you call like temporal commitment in that it, it's um, a big investment of your time and the life of a mortgage. You're not likely going to change that decision because of a two week lockdown. If it becomes a situation where it turns into a two month lockdown and your income is affected or your business is affected, that's a different story. And that's where the length of the lockdown really plays into how resilient the property market can be. But ultimately, um, I mean, the other thing about this period is that you can still technically, um, well, you could still physically inspect a private um, um use private inspection to in, uh, inspect a property. I'm not quite sure if that has changed now with the 10 kilometre um, radius limits that have been imposed on Sydney. Um, but certainly, you know, because the property market is a slower moving asset, circuit breaker lockdowns don't tend to have much of an impact. And how have you noticed the the volume? Because statistics are only relevant when you've got larger numbers. And, you know, if we're selling four properties and it's 75%, you know, strike rate, fine, you know, you sold three. But um, how are the transaction volumes? Are they being affected by these lockdowns? And then a, a, a deeper question after that is I'd like to see or know a little bit about how Melbourne sort of responded. And, and does that teach us anything about Sydney and how that will impact us? Yeah, so volumes have fallen. And this is another really key thing about the nature of the housing market through COVID-induced lockdowns. A lot of people worry about the demand side of things, that once you don't have buyers or renters out to get property, that's gonna the housing market's going to crash because you're just going to have all this overhang in supply, um, which will mount and put downward pressure on prices and put more people in you know negative equity and things like that. None of that happened last year. And the reason that none of it happened last year and the same thing that we're seeing now is because demand fell, but supply also fell. So if we see that in the auction numbers at the moment, they haven't been too bad. Um, Sydney's down to about 600 auctions for, or mm, closer to 700 auctions for this week. Uh, whereas in any given week, you'd probably see closer to 800, 1,000 in a, in a busy auction period for Sydney. Um, the, the listing space, we're already seeing a drop off in the number of properties being listed uh, for private treaty and auction. So um, new listings volumes across Sydney have fallen sharply in the last week um, because it's kind of like, um, you know, you might see around Christmas or, or New Year's that seasonal decline in supply and also a seasonal decline in demand. Doesn't mean the property market's gonna crash because people aren't out buying on Christmas day. It just means that we have this pretty engineered downturn where transaction activity slows right down. That's what happens during a circuit breaker. The key to maintaining that, however, is adequate government and institutional support. The reason you had people who were able to hold on to their properties through stage two lockdowns last year, through stage three and four lockdowns across Melbourne, was because the government was supporting households with JobKeeper and JobSeeker supplements. Um, banks were allowing mortgage repayment deferrals, which meant that those that didn't want to um, sell didn't have to sell. Um, you didn't see an influx of distressed property. And I think so much of that was not really the resilience of the property market so much as it was the strength of the government and institutional response. And that's why it's so important. And you hear so many people now, even the New South Wales treasurer saying, can we see the reinstating of JobKeeper? Because that was so key in supporting household um, housing costs, um, the employment relationships. And ABS data from last year showed us that the majority of JobKeeper recipients across Australia in terms of their tenure 
were homeowners with a mortgage. So no doubt JobKeeper was pivotal in that housing market stability piece as well. That's all very interesting because, you know, the doom sayers and, and, and the people that are waiting for the market to crash, they're out in every single economic environment. Um, they, they would be right in this instance because it's such a huge economic shock. But as you've said it, the reason why we didn't see a huge influx of supply is because the government provided us with an income, uh, interest rates are really low, so debt is very cheap to manage. And then you've also got major institutions such as the banks, you know, not forgiving interest, but delaying the payment of interest or, or making yeah. the, the, the interest repayments yeah, less, less impactful. You don't have to pay them straight away. So, you know, the system has supported itself or we've, we've supported, the system has supported the real estate market so it doesn't collapse. Yeah. And where and do, we see, well, where do yeah. we see things? Oh, sorry. No, no, you go. I was just going to say, I think that is um, that would continue to be a key feature of a lot of regulatory policy, institutional policy, because real estate as an asset in Australia makes up more than half of household wealth. That means that it is, it's an important pillar of the economy and economic activity, but it's also a very crucial implicit pillar of retirement in the sense that when people get older, they use housing as a source of equity for healthcare, aged care, um, intergenerational wealth, you know, supporting, supporting their family. So um, it, because of the reliance that has been built into Australian households on property, it is a, a sector that needs to have some stability and some protection around it. Same with the banking sector, about 60% of bank loan books are in the mortgage space. And um, I think, you know, I don't blame doom sayers who were calling a, you know, 30% crash or whatever. I think a lot of people were thinking the housing market was going to decline. The key thing that a lot of analysts and including myself, everyone I think missed was we underestimated the institutional response. Um, and I think we forget that the housing market doesn't operate in that perfect free market vacuum. It actually does have a lot of institutional parameters to, to keep some stability in the market. There are a lot of vested interests in the real estate <laughs> market staying uh, stable. And, and you highlighted some key points that I hadn't thought about with retirements and healthcare and um, you know, intergenerational wealth, but, you know, it's also just the, the, the building of it. So it provides a lot of jobs. Um, it's, it's a pivotal piece. And, and the fact that you've highlighted two other key factors that people don't think about is it, it represents more than 50% of people's household wealth. And then banks are out, you know, 60% of their loan books. So it's, mm -hmm. um, that's one of the reasons why I actually didn't see the market crashing is because Peter and I, when we discussed it, we thought there is so much dependent upon this industry. I don't see how the government and banks would allow for it to have such a significant crash without everything falling over. It's, it's really terrifying. Yeah. I thought yeah. if it falls yeah. over, like everything's gone. So it feels like we, we need to support it in its time of strain or in its time of, um, you know, dire need. Yeah, they have the capacity to do that. I think we definitely saw that with um, the, the mortgage repayment deferrals. I mean, that's an interesting one because people will eventually have to, you know, make up their interest costs and, and things like that. So, Overall, I think at the margin, it may create some more strain on households having gone through this period. Um, but uh, yeah, ultimately, it's it's reinforced um, housing as uh, an, an important pillar of the economy. And they've really showcased what kind of measures, uh, you know, regulators and institutions can go to to support the asset. So an interesting thing that I noticed in your article is that last year peak to trough decline was uh, it, it dropped basically two percent nationwide, and then this year the market's mm. basically surged about twelve percent. Um, 
you know, I know that you're not much for predictions and things. Uh, where do you see the market going after this? What's the next six six months look like to you? Yeah, I think COVID has thrown me a bit. Um, it's, you know, it, even through the current lockdown period, tracking the daily index for Sydney's dwelling market, um, values have increased a further 1.2% since we've been <laughs> in lockdown across Sydney. It seems that not much can uh, can stop the housing market at this stage. But one thing we have really started to notice is that the rate of growth has slowed down. So, for example, in the month of June, the uh, national housing market increased 1.9% uh, in value. So very strong monthly growth rate. But this is down from a peak of 2.8% in March earlier in the year. I would expect that growth rate to keep, uh, it, it's referred to as decelerating. So it's still increasing, but the rate of increase is, is falling. So if, if I'm to read between the lines, it, it sounds like in your mind, there's going to be a deceleration running into the end of the year. So we're going to see growth, but not as much as we did for the first half. And going into, this, going into next year, depending on what APRA says and what the RBA says, there may be some credit tightening. And if we do see that, availability of credit will come down, harder to get a loan, so less demand, and we may see the market start to cool off even further. Yes. I think they're all very valid points. Um, yeah, one and I love that kind how of, um, succinctly you put it as well. I feel like I should get you to write all my memos. And <laughs> no, no, it's my, my mind processes it in a, you know, how do I dumbify it? <laughs> and I simplify this thing. No, that was an excellent um, explanation. Yeah. Um, the one thing that sort of keeps me, and this is one again, we don't know, we can't, we can't control external factors, but this is all internal demand, and what we're seeing is a run of just the Australian market loving the Australian market, and we don't know what the world will look like once it starts to open up back again, and we start seeing students migration, tourism. Um, these are those unknowns. In my mind, it feels like these are all positive stimulus to the economy and it's going to be a stimulus to the property market. But again, who knows? And we'll hate to see how that then counterbalances with the cost of credit and all the other stuff that happens. Yeah, I think it is hard to, to know how the world will um, resume pre-COVID activity. NIFIC um, released a report and they made a pretty good point that just because international borders reopen doesn't mean people are going to be wealthy enough or prepared to start traveling right away. And as you say, Dom, a big part of the current upswing that we see in Australia, it's um, domestic owner occupier demand, but it's also, you know, a lot of demand that's been brought forward. Um, the first home mm. loan deposit scheme, home builder, first home builder stamp duty, dis uh, sorry, first home buyout stamp duty discounts, state-based grants for new homes, the new home loan deposit scheme, the family home guarantee. These are all policies which were introduced through 2020 that have taken, they've latched onto that massive um, demographic in Australia, the largest adult population, which is currently the first home buyer age group and pulling that demand forward and, and potentially triggering that demand earlier than it would have happened. So that demand, you know, when you pull it forward, it means it's not necessarily going to be there in, in a couple of years' time when it might have otherwise been there. So by that time, international migration will be very important for housing demand. Yeah, you can't spend your deposit twice. If you, if you used it up, it's gone. It's hard, it's hard to save 100K. Yeah, unless you're At very wealthy and day. buying lots of property. <laughs> yeah, you're a wealthy client. Yeah. Um, now, I, I was going to ask you one more question, Eliza, and it was, you know, when I pay attention to the market, I notice that there are certain patterns and it could be just me making them up. But it seems to me that certain markets run and then other markets play a little bit of catch up. Uh, would you say that some of the Australian markets have some catch up to, to some catching up to do? Like, you know, obviously the smaller markets ran the hardest. You had Darwin and Hobart and Canberra mm. ran crazy. Then you had Sydney, Brisbane do very well. Um, one outlier to me was Melbourne or Victoria did poorly, five percent price growth. 
which is basically half and if not a quarter of some of the other price growth that we saw, do you anticipate the Victorian market to, to have that catch up, to have that upswing the same as the rest of, the, of Australia? Um, it's, it's a great question. So you're quite right in that the seven, uh, yeah, about an 8% increase in, in Melbourne property values over the year compared with national was 13.5%. Um, and some of the capital city markets, Sydney was, um, up even further about 15% over the year. I think the difference is that it's, it wasn't necessarily reflective of cyclical patterns that we've seen historically. I think it was purely structural stuff around COVID. You know, the fact that Melbourne had extended lockdowns, the fact that ACT didn't have a single month of decline during COVID because um, it had a very tight lab- labor market, low case numbers, things like that. Um, I don't, I actually think that the Melbourne market will continue to be impacted by the lingering effects of COVID, namely the closure of international borders. Um, before COVID, Melbourne was the the city where most um, international migrants would initially um, settle in Australia, particularly those inner city areas. And I think the subdued rental demand is still having an impact on on some of those inner city markets. Um, I think, yeah, the there was also the temporary um, stamp duty discount for Victoria where, Uh, It was to the 1st of July, I believe, you could get access to um, discounted stamp duty on properties up to $1 million. Even now, we've seen Mm. the difference in auction volumes before and after that deadline. Um, So unless they introduce more incentives, I can't see too much more of a a catch-up in demand off off of that. Um, for Sydney, I would say in this current period, we probably will see a catch up in sales volumes coming out of a circuit breaker lockdown um, mm. and potentially even if it becomes an extended lockdown. I think there might be some housing decisions that get postponed and we'll see some catch up in sales after that. But Melbourne, I think, unfortunately, the the demographic situation is just a bit weaker there at the moment. And that market will probably really thrive again when we see more normal levels of international visitation. Yeah, one thing that I noticed with population growth in Melbourne is it was one of the first times it ever lost a population. It seemed like Brisbane was catching or Queensland was catching everybody. Sydney lost people, Melbourne lost people. And Melbourne's not used to that. It's normally like a net positive. So that was an yeah. interesting statistic for me. But Melbourne's only been positive because of international migration in recent years. If you look, and you'd, you've probably seen this as well, if you look purely at internal migration for Sydney and Melbourne, they've typically lost more people internally um, that have moved to regions or other parts of the country. Queensland's long been a a winner when it comes to internal migration. Any Aussies moving around, many of them want to go to Queensland. Um, And that's why that market is really, or that migration story at least, has really continued to thrive um, throughout the pandemic. Awesome. Thank you for the breakdown today, Eliza. We've got to go through quite a number of topics and um, I'm glad to see that our our network connections now stabilize as we finalize. Um, (laughs) Before we finish up, can I can I ask you, have you got any sort of hints or tips or things that we should be mindful of, the people that are listening out there watching what, what recent reports or what market should we look at or what's something that's interesting to you in this uh, real estate market of ours? Yeah, I definitely say if you're keen to learn more about the housing market in COVID, go to corelogic.com.au forward slash news. We've got the report available for free up there. Um, in this market, I'm really curious to see um, what uh, I think we've talked about this before, but Tasmania. <laughs> you said um, Launceston actually, last time? I said Launceston. I still believe. And I, so COVID permitting, I'm actually traveling down there in September. So I have never actually been to Launceston, but it just seems such a no-brainer to me in terms of the relatively low levels of development, low levels of stock, and yet we're in a period where um, national sort of um, 
in, what am I saying? Interstate tourism, rather, sorry, is is coming back and, and thriving. And Tasmania has really transferred to uh, really flourished as a tourism hub over the years. Um, I'm interested to follow that market. Um, and also just more broadly to see how COVID has kind of reshaped workforces. We'll be looking forward to some detailed employment data coming out of the ABS to see what professions have grown in in which areas and just how normalized I guess remote work has become for high income professionals as well. Well, I can't wait to hear what you have to say when you come back from Launceston and when we've got the new ABS data. Um, And I believe a census is coming. So there's going to be plenty of data coming out then. Yeah, so I think we do the census very soon, but then it might be a while before we get all that um yeah detailed information yeah well again thank you for jumping on the show today we've got lots to talk about next time um and in the meantime have uh, enjoy your your lock up and as much as you can do and um <laughs> stay safe everybody i hope you enjoyed the podcast like su- subscribe and and um check out eliza from core logic chat to you all soon great thank you dom <laughs>